Uh, Joshua chapter 1 is where we're uh, going to jump in. What we've done up to this point has really been preparatory because the, the battle for Canaan, though it's, um, it is super cool, <clears throat> the, the battle for Canaan has to be understood in the broader parameters of, of how of the, the frame in which the Bible sets it, right? So we talked about how, how the, the land of Canaan, Canaan, or the promised land, is really promised to Abraham, right? And so it's in, that, um, it's in that context that it's promised to Israel. So when we learned about Abraham, then we could be able to start to draw some conclusions about what God is doing, right? And when we talked about Abraham, Abraham is promised this land that he will inherit, but we found out that even though Abraham, his descendants inherit a physical land, that's not really what Abraham was looking for, was it? It's a spiritual land. Okay? And then when, uh, when it's called a land of rest... Right? We talk about really what that means, a land of rest from war. We might also say it's a land of peace. Right? <clears throat> but the, the promised rest, Hebrews brings out, is not a physical rest either. That's also spiritual, right? So, neither of those things, they were fulfilled in a temporary physical way. Yes, Abraham's physical descendants did inherit the land, but God was pointing to something spiritual. Yes, they did enter a land of rest, but Joshua spoke of another day after that, right? So, what I'm trying to point out is that the Scriptures, while using those physical examples, are really trying to point our attention to something that is spiritual and something that is yet in the future. Okay? The third one we talked about last week, right? the land of, of, uh, of Canaan is inhabited already. Right? And the reason that God was going to prosecute the war against the tribes of Canaan is not because God, you know, just liked that piece of dirt or because He had something specifically against Canaanites, <clears throat> but it was because they were idol worshippers. We're trying to point out that the idol is the physical placeholder, right? But that's not the real problem. The real problem in Canaan was what was behind the idol. Paul brings this out in the New Testament, the Old Testament as well, makes it quite clear. <clears throat> they didn't sacrifice just to idols. They sacrificed to the demonic powers. Okay? Idols are just the placeholders. They're just the object lessons, right? But <clears throat> the real thing, the real thing is a demonic power behind the idol. So we noted that wherever idol worship went, even though the names, though generally similar, might change slightly from one culture to the next, <clears throat> the name seems to have a transcendent owner and the practice doesn't vary. Little alteration here or there, <clears throat> but it's always the same thing. It's always institutionalized immorality and the systematic slaughter of the children born as a result. Right? <clears throat> and then we drew some uncomfortable connections to our own culture and time. Okay? Point is, <clears throat> the land of Canaan was inhabited, but God, when He began with the ten plagues in Egypt, was really working on a spiritual plane, not the physical. It wasn't the Canaanites He had a beef with. He was demonstrating his superiority over the demonic powers. Okay? That leads us up to just a, almost. We almost crossed the Jordan tonight. We're not quite going to get there, but we're, it's really close. <clears throat> Before we can go conquer the land, what should we do? Yeah, we better check it out first, don't you think? We better go spy it out. I always think it's interesting. I haven't figured out how this is significant, although I'm sure it is. <clears throat> Some of you guys, put your, put your brain power to this, all right? Put your thinking caps on. See if you can figure this out. <clears throat> when Moses originally comes to the Jordan River, he sends in 12 spies, right? Right. <clears throat> right. And then 10 were bad and 2 were good, right? 
So Joshua, apparently, he learned the lesson. So when he comes to the Jordan River, he only sends in the two good ones. He doesn't send the ten bad. That was a joke, right? Joshua only sent in two. I figured, or I guess he figured he only needed two because uh, that was going to be that was going to be enough. Joshua sends them in, but uh, in uh, um, in Joshua chapter one. I want to give you the first nine verses here. It sets the stage. It's just a, just a great um, go get them. In verse 1, it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant. And he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun, will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I have been with you. With Moses, I will be with you, I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. You shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wow, that's a... That's one for the gipper and better, isn't it? The Lord says, Joshua, listen. Moses is dead. And the mantle falls to you. Joshua, it's your job to finish what Moses started. He said, Joshua, you're going to go in. You are going to conquer them. No one will stand before you. Just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Meditate on the book of the law. Do according to all that I commanded you. Be strong and courageous. There's there's no room for cowards. Be strong and be courageous. Boys, are you paying attention? Excellent. No messing around. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. You do just what I told you to do. And he said, I will not. I won't leave you. He said, I will be with you just as I was with Moses. We're about to to enter the the second half, right? This is the the second half pep talk. And so... Be strong and be courageous. Don't tremble. Don't be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The battle for Canaan, if you recall, is going to take place in three engagements, roughly. The first one is at Jericho, right? And then a little burg right next to that called Ai. The second one starts just right there in that neighborhood, but it's going to end up going to the south, all the way to a place called Makeda. Okay? So the second battle is really the battle for the south, because the, the southern guys come up and, and they attack um, near where um, Israel is camped. And, uh, and when they fight them, then they chase them back down to the south. Okay? <clears throat> and then the third battle is a battle in the north, about, well... 10 miles plus north of Galilee at a place called Merim. It's a big kind of a swampy area and then then there's a a lake of, it's not very big. It's like 10 square miles. It's it's not super large. But the Jordan River kind of collects there, flows out of that into the Sea of Galilee and then down into the Dead Sea later. So one at Jericho, two 
south of Maqueda, and three north above Galilee near Merim. Everybody with me? Those three battles are the, are the three major engagements of the campaign of Canaan. <clears throat> so, and, and we'll kind of cover them in the same way that, uh, that, the, that the Scripture works through them. But <clears throat> in, uh, uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, Joshua the son of Nun sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and they came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Right? Some, uh, some, some quick facts about Jericho. Everybody knows about Jericho, right? Who fought the battle of Jericho? That's right, Joshua. And what happened to the walls? They came a tumbling down. Excellent. Right? You can talk about your men. Good, good, good. You guys know the tune, right? <clears throat> you went to Sunday school. You should know that song. Right? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and he's preparing to do that. So he's going to send in two spies. And he says, I want you to check out the land, especially Jericho. I want you to check out Jericho. I want you to see what it's like. What would they have reported back to Joshua? They did make it back to Joshua, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But when they saw Jericho, what did Jericho look like, Tim? Uh, massive wall. Massive wall. And there were grapes along the top. And they taunted, if my memory is right. That's right. Exactly, right? Do you guys remember, you, if you remember from the, the uh, proof booklet, or, or uh, uh, that is drawn itself from Halley's Bible Handbook, John Garstang's excavation of Jericho, right? He found that Jericho was indeed a walled city, like most of the cities of its day. It was a city-state, right? And so the best protection was a large, solid wall, right? And so Jericho has that. Jericho's wall is a double wall. The outer wall is about six feet thick. The inner wall is twice that. It's 12 feet thick. <clears throat> and there's a gap of about 15 feet between them where they throw junk and who knows whatever else. <clears throat> and then there were houses built across the top of the two walls. And they're about 30 feet tall. 30 feet doesn't sound like it's very tall until you're at the top of 30 feet looking down. And then 30 feet look... Am I not right, Brian? And then 30 feet looks like a long ways. Or if you're at the bottom of 30 feet wondering how you're going to get to the top, that also looks a lot farther. <clears throat> There's a significant wall, right? <clears throat> and these guys were, uh, um, they put their faith in that wall. That wall was going to save them. That wall, if, I mean, nobody's going to knock that down. <clears throat> Jericho. Jericho was a pretty fortified little burg, right? Jericho was, uh, was locked down tight because they knew that the Israelites were out there just on the other side of the Jordan, and furthermore, they knew that there were spies in the land. Mm -mm -mm. There were spies, <clears throat> and so Joshua sent those two in. It's important that we note that the Jordan River has not yet been crossed. Okay? <clears throat> so what's happening, because that actually plays a really important role here in trying to, trying to um, make the necessary attachments to the spiritual things that these physical events foreshadow. Okay? The Jordan River has not been crossed yet. There are a couple spies sent over, but Israel remains on the eastern side of the Jordan. They've not crossed over yet into the land of Canaan. Everybody with me? We're just sending some spies. We're going to do a sneaky-like, right? <clears throat> so he sends those two spies in, <clears throat> and strangely enough, they end up at the house of Rahab. Okay. Now, Rahab herself is an interesting character. And, uh, uh, oh, you know what? Pardon me. I, I need to back up here a little bit. Um, we're going to back up by going forward. So turn to Revelation chapter 18. I need to let you in on a little secret early, um, so that this makes more sense. <clears throat> I love how, have you ever heard this? Um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Have, have you heard that before? You know, it's not an exact... Re well, some of you, congratulations. You learned something new tonight. That was worth the price of admission. <clears throat> right? 
sometimes, I mean, history isn't exactly the same, but man, it seems like the same themes pop up, don't they? The Bible is full of stuff like that, right? And this is one of those things. Okay? <clears throat> Jericho is this impenetrable, walled city. Can't be, can't be taken. Did you ever hear of a walled city like that? That couldn't be broken down? There was just, walls were so massive, couldn't be, couldn't be destroyed. Did you, ever, did you ever hear of a walled city like that? Maybe one in the Bible, I don't know, just saying. Maybe one that starts with B? Yeah. I was going to say the Vatican. The Vatican. <laughs> that was close, Tim. I think there might be a connection, right? <clears throat> Babylon is another walled city, right? And it's the greatest of them all. There was never a city of... A, there was never a city like Babylon, nor has there ever been one since, in, in that, in, in um, prior to the Industrial Revolution. Okay? There never been anything close to that. It, it really was the city of gold. It's it, it, immense. Doesn't begin to describe it. But Babylon was quite a city, right? I mean, we've talked a little bit about that before. Jericho is Babylon at one-tenth the scale. Babylon is enormous. And everything about Babylon is bigger. You'd think it was in Texas because the walls are higher and they're thicker. And I mean, it's incomprehensible the effort and, uh, that they put into the engineering and the building of the city of Babylon. And that city could never be taken, ever. But it was, wasn't it? And in the most unlikely of ways. You guys remember very well, right, that under the command of Darius the Mede, the Persian army, the Medes and Persians, they redirected the flow of the Euphrates River, walked under the gates of Babylon, where the Euphrates would typically flow. But not even that was enough. Because it's not, like the, it's not like the builders of Babylon thought that could never happen. I mean, they had a contingency plan for everything, right? These guys, they managed to get under those gates. But there's walls all along the banks of the river. But somebody left the door open. And while the Babylonians, no kidding, while they were feasting their gods, a hand appeared on the wall, writing... Right? You've been weighed in the scales and found wanting. And that night, Belshazzar and all of Babylon was sacked in one night. The battle was over before it ever began. Babylon, I mean, that's, that's an amazing, that's a cool story, right? Turn to Revelation chapter 18. <clears throat> That is a cool story. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 18. In let's, um, let's start in verse 8 here. For this reason, in one day, her plagues will come pestilence, mourning, famine. She'll be burned up with fire. The Lord God who judges her is strong. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, in one hour your judgment has come. The merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, articles of ivory, articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, perfume, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, and human lives. What's Babylon? Babylon's the world system. It's where things are bought and sold. Commodities are traded. Deals are made, right? 
It's where, it's where fortunes, merchants, it's where cargoes, right, of all those things are bought, sold, traded. It's a place, it's a, it's a, it's a mercantile, right? The kings of the earth, they do business there. In all those things, everything of valuable, it's all there, right? And they say, <clears throat> in, uh, they can't find all of those things anymore. They say in verse 16, Woe, woe, the great city, she who was clothed in fine linen, purple, scarlet, adorned with gold, precious stones, pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. Every shipmaster, every passenger, sailor, as many as make their living by the sea, stood at a distance. They're crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning. They said, What city is like the great city? Babylon in one hour is brought down. Now, Revelation 18 is not talking about the Babylon of the Babylonian Empire. It's talking about the world system. But it uses Babylon. See, what could be a better, <clears throat> a, a better metaphor for the world system than Babylon? <clears throat> Anything you want, you can get it. Right? In Babylon. That's where all the riches of the world. It's the center of the world empire, right? Nebuchadnezzar, the great king, see, <clears throat> the head of gold, <clears throat> sits on his throne in Babylon. It's the center of world power. <clears throat> it's the center of idolatry. It's the center of buying and selling. It's the world system. And it can never be brought down. I mean, look outside. It's perfectly solid. Right? I mean, everything... <clears throat> it's not going any place. Anything you want, you can find it here. The world system gives the facade of security. Of, they'll put it this way, peace and safety. How about that? Does that sound better? Right? <clears throat> this thing ain't going away. Right? I mean, look at it. It's never going to stop. This is fantastic. Right? The world system is solid and secure. Nothing's going to mess that up. Right? It's a perfect, isn't it a great picture of the world? Babylon, <clears throat> where you can have it all. That's what the world is. And everything gets bought and sold. Everything's for sale in Babylon. Even human lives for sale. In the great city, right? Ah, the great city. <clears throat> Jericho is a, is a, it's like a, can you have an early echo? <clears throat> I don't know. Babylon is kind of the big splash in the pond. <clears throat> but the ripples that go out from that, Jericho is one of those. Where you can see a lot of the same elements that are in Babylon are in Jericho. Here's the secret. <clears throat> the battle of Jericho, and we'll talk about it in more detail next week. I, um, we're going to talk about Rahab tonight, but you need this piece of information to make Rahab fit in her context, okay? Jericho is a picture of the world, and the battle of Jericho is a picture of the destruction of the world. And Rahab is caught inside. Now, normally, <clears throat> we think those guys in Jericho, right, they depend on those walls, right? They know when Israel comes across the Jordan River, they're going to need those walls to repel invaders and, you know, throw stuff and things like that. Okay. So they're depending on those walls. <clears throat> <clears throat> What if you're inside, and what if you're Rahab? See, to the people of Jericho, those walls were a source of protection, safety, right? Confidence, security. What if you're Rahab? Come on, think about it. That thing's a prison. You got to read, this is so cool. So go back to Joshua. <clears throat> In doo -doo 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 -doo, Joshua chapter 2, 
Man, I almost just have to read the whole thing because it's, I can't, um, we'll just read uh, 1 through 21. I believe in you, you can do it. Joshua sends out the spies. In verse 2, it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. The king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, Yes, the men came to me. I did not know where they were from. It came about when it was time to shut the gate. At dark, the men went out. I don't know where they went. But if you pursue them quickly, you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan, uh, to the fords. And as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof. And she said to the men, you got to, this is great. She said to the men, so she's hidden them. She knows who they are. She knows that. The, the, the Jericho police are looking for him, right? And so she takes and she puts him up on the roof under some flax, okay? So she goes up, she says, I know, verse 9, the Lord has given you the land. And the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. We know what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth. Spare my father and mother, my brothers, sisters, all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. That's awesome! Right? Rahab, her house is on the wall. Right? She receives the spies, <clears throat> right? hides them up on the roof, and she says, Listen, I get it. I know the Lord has given you the city. I know He's given you everything. We remember what you did to the Lord, to the Egyptians, and how He opened the Red Sea. We remember. We know what the Lord did to the two kings of the Amorites. We know. And she says, I know that God has given you this city. Make me a deal. I've dealt, I've dealt fairly with you. Make me a deal. When you conquer the city, spare us. Are you starting to put the pieces together? Who's Rahab? Turn to, turn to Matthew uh, chapter 1. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1, in verse 5. Interestingly, <clears throat> and to Salmon was born Boaz by Rahab, and to Boaz was born Obed by Ruth, and to Obed Jesse, and to Jesse was born David the king. <clears throat> The genealogy is not only David's, but it goes on in Matthew to point out that this is the genealogy of Jesus. And and Rahab, the woman from Jericho, is his great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother. Right? Uh, Boaz snatched her up, um, uh, or uh, excuse me, Salmon, um, through Rahab, gave birth to Boaz. Right. Turn over to uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Just a quick stop here, and then one in James, and then we'll try and put the pieces together. Hebrews chapter 11. In verse 31, or verse, let's do 30 and 31. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And by faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Hebrews 11 puts Rahab in the hall of faith with other greats like Abraham, Joseph, Noah, Moses, Isaac, Jacob, and others, right? 
And there she is, this woman of uh, uh, this woman of Jericho. And then James chapter two, right next to Abraham again. <clears throat> in uh, in verse twenty four. He summarizes Abraham, You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? The answer is yes, she was. But how could that be? Because Rahab was a harlot. I think it's important that we point this out. You know, in the, it's become more and more um, evident that many of the young women who are in uh, who who are harlots are not so by their own choice the vast majority of people <clears throat> who are sold uh, they're not entrepreneurs someone else is selling them okay i can't um, the scripture doesn't comment on rahab's uh, on her um, condition um, other than that's what she did. It's quite possible Rahab didn't have a choice. Okay? <clears throat> but Rahab was a woman of faith. And whatever else she was, was secondary to that. Why did Joshua send spies to Jericho in the first place? He sends them specifically with the instructions, go spy out the land, and especially Jericho, right? What for? Was it going to change Joshua's battle plan? Actually, the walls are 40 feet tall rather than 30. Last time we were here, they were 30, but now they've raised them. Oh, we're going to have to rethink everything. Of course not. What do you want to know? What's the distance between Jericho and Ai? doesn't say. I don't know what it was that Joshua was looking for, but I know what God was seeking. <clears throat> There's a great... Um, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. The Lord knows. I don't know what the spies thought they were looking for, but I know why God sent them. The only thing worth saving in Jericho is Rahab. She's the only one. Through her faith, the rest of her family is saved. Rahab was the only one Worth saving. She was the only one who had faith. Everybody else, they were going to put their confidence in those walls, man. Either the walls is going to save us or we're not going to be saved at all. Rahab knew better. She said, no, no, no. I know the Lord has given you the city. And she cuts a deal at the risk of her own life. If the king of Jericho finds out that Rahab let these guys over the wall... And told them how to escape the patrols that they sent after, which she did. What's it mean for her? She has placed herself at odds with the system of Jericho, with the powers that be, because she has sworn her allegiance to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When she said, we're going to make a deal. There's another word for that. That word is covenant. We're going to make us a deal. Right? I've dealt fairly with you. When you take the city, spare me, spare the rest of my household. And you remember, of course, the deal they made. They said, well, they weren't in much of a position to negotiate, were they? They said, good idea. Yes, we'll do that. But hang a red cord out your window so we'll know which house not to utterly destroy. Right? Rahab, the Jericho is a picture of the world. Right? Crossing the Jordan is when Jesus returns. Okay? They haven't crossed the Jordan yet. Right? They're waiting on the other side. Okay? <clears throat> Jericho is a picture of the world system. 
And there are spies sent into Jericho to find those who are faithful, who will make a deal with the Lord. Swear allegiance to Him and put their trust in that system. Is everybody with me so far? Isn't that amazing? Rahab's you. Those, you think, do you think she liked the city? It's great. It's really, it's really super city. Really great place to be. <clears throat> See, to the people who put their trust in the walls of Jericho, they wanted to be on the inside. But <clears throat> if that wasn't you, if you're Rahab, meant Jericho is a prison. What's the world? <clears throat> Peace, safety. What the Lord is looking for <clears throat> inside the world are men and women of faith. God's not going to sweep away the wicked with the righteous. God went to great lengths to save Rahab because He knew, the spies didn't know, but He knew where she was. And I often have wondered how it is that they came to be at her house. Are they trying to get out? Are they trying to get to the wall? Are they? And I furthermore wonder how it was that they had to divulge to her who they were. Because that wouldn't exactly be something you'd put on your name badge. Hello, you know, my name is Benjamin. I'm from the tribe of, and we're just visiting. We're touring the city. You know, we're just, oh, we're just tourists. We're just taking some pictures. There's a selfie of us against the wall. <laughs> right? <clears throat> How'd that happen? Do you ever wonder... How you meet the people you meet? How it comes up in conversation? Right. That you're a servant of the Most High God? Do you ever wonder why <clears throat> your paths cross with somebody else's? And when and where? The Lord's looking, isn't He? He's looking. For the faithful. And he got them all out of Jericho. The system was going to come down. But God was going to make sure that he saved those who had faith. And Rahab is a picture of the church inside the world. And uh, next week, the world is coming down. So, all right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we're very grateful that you didn't leave anybody behind. <clears throat> that even inside the walls of Jericho, locked up tight, you were still able to find Rahab and her household and save them. And Father, as tremendous as that seems, Lord, it pales by comparison to what you're doing even now as inside the walls of, of this Babylon, um, you've sent your spies that, um, uh, that they, might, um, they might call and, and, and find those who are... Uh, uh, those who have faith, <clears throat> they'd be brought um, into that household and, uh, and spared. Lord, we're grateful that, um, that you do take such great care to, um, uh, to find and, and to save um, those who have faith. Help us, Father, to be diligent to uh, be in that household. And Father, help us to, to grab others, our, the rest of our acquaintances and family and those who belong to us and bring them as well that... Uh, that, that that house would be filled. Lord, we pray that... Um, Lord, we know the land is yours. And um, Father, we look forward to the day um, when everyone recognizes the same. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>